business. So thank you very much. It's, been, it's, it's a great honour to be asked to come and say something at this um, conference in, in honour of um, Duncan Forrester. So thank you for the invitation. And I would still to think about embodiment and Aruna's challenge, um, because one of the ways I like to think about embodiment and the body of, of Christ is to, is to, I suppose, realise the paradox that... Um, you know, we always have to get ourselves out of the way in order to make room for Christ and to make room for the grace of God. So when, when, are, when is it that we are embodying what we are called to embody? And it's often when we've managed to let go of other things, you know, sort of bodily, physically, mentally, um, emotionally. What do we need to let go of? But also, we, you know, we can ask that on, a, on an individual level. Um, and, you know, the church, churches are often, I think, quite good at teaching about that, about the need to sort of, what do you need to die to, that, that kind of question. But are not always so good at asking it of themselves as the body of Christ, of ourselves as the body of Christ collectively. And I think especially when it comes to ecumenism, so it's, it's really important that, that what Aruna has said in that respect too, because um, I think often what happens ecumenically when churches get together, they think, okay, we need to honour the life of Christ in us, of course, so we're going to bring all our gifts to the table. Right? So then you've got everybody's gifts on the table. Um, and there isn't, at least not in my experience of, of working ecumenically, um, there isn't very often a, a movement that says, OK, um, what do we need to die to? <laughs> what, do we need to what, what of ourselves do we need to get out of the way? What do we need to get out of the way? Um, in what ways do we, it might be in what ways do we need to get down on our knees. Sometimes it's that, and I'm going to tell a few stories. Um, uh, but sometimes it's what skills do we need to get out of our way, actually. And again, I, so I want to tell some stories that, that ask that question about how we make room for the grace of God, how we make room for the life of Christ in us. Um, and some of these stories are, are sort of corporate I mean, corporate means bodily, doesn't it? But some of them are corporate in the sense of involving more than one person. <laughs> and some of them are bodily and involving only one person. So um, the first two stories are about um, the power of prayer, and particularly the prayer that Jesus um, taught us, about the power of the Lord's Prayer in getting ourselves out of the way and bringing us some release and changing our behaviour. Um, the first story I want to tell, it may well have become quite well known now, and I, I've, I think about this story often, and so forgive me if you're feeling over-familiar with it, but it, it's the story of um, the peacemakers, uh, Jean and, and Hildegard Goss Meyer, um, who visited Poland ten years after the end of the Second World War, and they write about this in their own account of their peacemaking work, and uh, Walter Wink has also picked up this story and uh, written about it. So, um, during their visit to Poland, they were, they were together with um, some Polish Christians and some German Christians. And No, sorry, they were with some Polish Christians, and they asked the Polish Christians if they would be willing to meet um, a, a, a party of Christians from Germany who were visiting Poland. Would they be willing to meet with, with these West German Christians? And the response of the Polish Christians was that, no, they wouldn't. They wouldn't be willing to meet them. Um, and and one, one of them explained um, that, you know, what you're asking is impossible because uh, each stone of Warsaw is soaked in Polish blood. So we can't forgive. So they carried on the meeting with the Polish Christians, and at the end of the meeting, they said they would, they would end by saying the Lord's Prayer together as their final uh, act together. And when they reached the words, forgive us our sins as we forgive, everyone stopped praying. And the tensions built up until the Pole who had spoken most vehemently at the beginning said, I must say yes to you. I could no more pray the Our Father, and I could no longer call myself a Christian, if I refuse to forgive. And he said, humanly speaking, I can't do it, but God will give us strength. So humanly speaking, they had to pull right back and let God come into them as a group of Christians, individually too, but, but come into them to enable that behavior of meeting with the West German Christians. 
And the story is actually a very lovely one. The, the, the German and Polish Christians became lifelong friends and had, had many meetings since. And, and actually, one of the things I love about the story is that, is that, is that we can tell it now. <laughs> and it can, it can carry on, and it can, it can continue inspiring. So in a sense, it embodies something that we can pass on, and we can think how to, how to embody something similar. The second story is, uh, that I would like to tell you, they're all true stories that I'm going to tell you, is um, a story told by Dorothy Surla um, in response to Simon Wiesenthal's wartime remembrance, which he called the sunflower. Is anyone here familiar with, with the sunflower? If, if some sang <laughs> a few of you are. Um, in the sunflower, Simon Wiesenthal tells the true story of his experience um, as, as Polish Jewish, um, of being um, of, of his maltreatment by the uh, Nazi soldiers, and he, for whatever reason, um, was called out one day in order to, and he didn't know why. I mean, he was living under extreme oppression, and he was called out, for, you know, in his wretched state, from amongst his fellow Polish Jews, into this sort of hospital building, and he, what, nothing was explained to him about what he was supposed to be doing. And he was taken up these stairs, and he was taken into the room, and he was taken into a room of a dying man. And the dying man was a Nazi soldier called Karl. And Karl was in, in, the, in his last, you know, last sort of last lease of life, really. And, and he was deeply remorseful. And he asked if um, he, he wanted to die in peace. And so he asked if Simon would forgive him. And Simon was put in a dilemma. <laughs> and actually, he left the room in silence and did, didn't impart forgiveness. Um, when, he was, when he returned with this, this, this group to the hospital the next day, um, he was met by the same nurse, and he was told that Carl had died. So a question that then remained for Simon for the duration of the war and afterwards um, is... Should he have forgiven him? Um, and he asked that of many people during the war years and subsequently, and many people have written replies, including Albert Speer and Desmond Tutu and Dorothy Serler and many others. Um, what Simon did do, actually, subsequently after the war was visit Carl's mother and take him Carl's belongings. And he never told Carl's mother of that episode or of the things that, he, all the, things that the Nazis had done. But that question, should he have forgiven him, remains a very live question. He said, Forgive, he said forgetfulness will be dealt with in time. You know, time will deal with that. If I forget, that's because time has done that. But, but should I forgive? And that's a moral question, and it's one that, that remains an open question for him. Um, and it's very interesting reading the responses others, others make, and, and you'll, they're, they're all printed in, in a, you know, you can buy a copy of the Sunflower with multiple responses to his question. Dorothy Serla's story on the back of that question is that she learned um, that one of her professors, who was a, a gentle and sensitive man, um, she learned subsequently that he had been involved in Nazi book burnings, and she wanted to understand this. And so she, she went to speak to him about it, and she, she asked him about it, and he went very silent. And then, um, then he started to, to look very agonized, and he leant forward, and he wrung his hands, and then he fell on the floor. And then he started to say the Lord's Prayer. And she didn't know what to do, so she got down on the floor with him, and they said the Lord's Prayer together. So I think, again, the power of the Lord's Prayer, or the power, that, yes, the power of the Lord's Prayer specifically was a gift to us by Jesus, the prayer that Jesus taught us, um, to bring some release, to bring some honesty, because perhaps this man had perhaps never been asked that before. You know, Dorothy Saylor was saying to him, which books did you burn? Did you burn Gogol's books? You know, the very direct questions. And, and that will have taken him right down to the very depths. Um, and, you know, I think... I do love all the paradoxes involved in this. We, we have to go right down to the very depths if we're going to get healing, because that's, you know, that's where... If, if we don't get down there, then we don't get down to all the bits that need, that need healing. So prayer took, he was taken right down there um, and had the words, thankfully, of the Lord's Prayer um, to say. And prayer, of course, 
you know, it has its source in God and it returns to God. Um, and the Lord's Prayer is a very nice example of that because it is given to us by Jesus and we can, we can give it back um, to God. The next two stories I wanted to um, tell you about are stories about, about skill, if you like. You know, I was saying that sometimes it's our skill we need to get out of the way. We just need to get ourselves <laughs> out of the way. Um, so I want to tell these two stories um, from two different chaplains who felt themselves to be professionally um, ill-equipped and, and plunged into feelings of helplessness and, uh, and, and just went with that, really, because what choice did they have? And they had to accept um, that sort of abandonment. And in accepting that, they found um, their ministerial insights and they found that their, their insights and their capacity returned to them. And again, it's a model of grace, you know, making room for grace. So the first is an incident told to me by a hospital chaplain who was asked to hear um, the final confession and administer the last rites to a man who was greatly distressed, but the man couldn't speak. And so the chaplain was wondering how he could hear the last, how he could, how he could hear the final confession of somebody who couldn't speak. And it wasn't something that had been in his experience before, and he just did not know <laughs> what, what does one do. So, so what he did um, was to ask the man to offer his distress to God, because that was something, you know, the man was very distressed, to offer that distress to God so that God could transform it. Uh, so the man could do that without needing to speak. And, and the man became calm, and the chaplain then asked the nurses to assist him with um, anointing the man with oil in the giving of the last rites. And this occasion, I think it brought, from the way the chaplain told it, it brought peace to the dying man, and it brought insight to the chaplain. And it also returned something of great value to the nurses, because the nurses said um, it put them back in touch with what they called the sacramental side of their vocation, because usually you only get to use your hands often in, in nursing care today for sort of drips and toileting and that sort of thing. So they, they were then involved. And I'll tell you one final story, um, again, about feeling de-skilled, but getting your skills back. So this is from a chaplain who had a chaplain here in Edinburgh who had a ministry amongst those with HIV and AIDS in the 1980s and 90s, and she would clean and shop for them and watch with them when they were dying. And as she waited with them, she'd, she'd jot down thoughts and um, things that they'd said that would help her to construct their funerals. Um, and, and she called these jottings the fragments of the watch. Um, and her former boss was the, the Bishop of Edinburgh, Richard Holloway, and he's... He, he got permission from her to let him, let him write some of this down, which he, he did. So one concerns a young woman who was very afraid of dying. Um, I don't want to die, she said. Him upstairs will get a big stick and shout at me and tell me to go to hell. And I'm frightened and I don't want to be shouted at. And the chaplain wrote, I hugged her, bereft of anything theological to say that sounded real. And she snuggled in. Talk to me, she whimpered. And the chaplain at this point had no idea what to say. So she, again, that feeling of being de-skilled. And so she just found herself saying, there was a man who had two sons. And she goes on to say, I told her the story of the prodigal son and the loving father. Will you be with me when I die and be sure to tell me that story? So I did, about an hour ago. And now we are waiting for the undertakers. I'll end there.